MBK, 2, 17, Arjuna slaughters the Kauravas Chapter 17 Arjuna slaughters the Kauravas some time before sunrise on the thirteenth day of battle, Yudhishthira arose from his bed, awoken by bards and minstrels singing his praises. Melodious songs were played as the Pandava king performed his ablutions, assisted by a hundred servants who fetched water in golden jars as well as soaps, unguents, perfumes and other items. His limbs were dogged with pure sandalwood paste as Brahmins chanted holy Vedic mantras. Servants then brought Yudhishthira his fine white garments and adorned him with fragrant lotus and champaka flower garlands. Having bathed and dressed, the king faced east and worshipped Krishna with Vedic prayers, his heart absorbed in love. After this he went before the sacred fire and made offerings to Vishnu and the gods, invoking auspiciousness and praying for victory in battle. Emerging from his tent, Yudhishthira saw a number of aged and venerable Brahmins. The old sages, a thousand in number, were accompanied by a further eight thousand disciples. They uttered benedictions and blessed Yudhishthira, who distributed charity to them. The king gave away jars of gold to each of the Brahmins, as well as cows, horses, cloth, honey, ghee, fruits, and other valuable items. Then he entered the council chamber. He sat upon a throne made entirely of gold and covered with a precious silk carpet. When he had taken his seat, his orderlies came and decorated him with ornaments of pearl, gold, and priceless gems. The monarch shone like a mass of clouds emitting bright flashes of lightning. He was fanned by gold-handled yaktail whisks as white as the moon. Bards again sang his praises and the music and voices of the Gandharavas could be heard in the sky. Outside the tent a tremendous clatter of chariot wheels and horses hooves resounded as the other kings and warriors came to council. Conch shell blasts filled the air, and the measured march of infantry seemed to shake the earth as the troops headed for the field. As the kings took their places in Yudhishthira's council chamber after first bowing before him, a guard informed him that Krishna had arrived Yudhishthira ordered that he be shown in immediately and offered a fine seat by his side. He personally stepped down from his throne as Krishna entered and showed him to his seat. Taking the offering of Argya held out by a Brahmin, Yudhishthira performed the worship Krishna waved to Satyaki to sit with him, and the two Yadavas shared the same large throne next to Yudhishthira. When he had again taken his seat, Yudhishthira began by addressing Krishna, O Madhusudana, have you passed the night in happiness? Like celestials relying on the thousand Indra, we depend on you alone for victory and indeed for eternal happiness. Our very existence depends upon you. If it pleases you, therefore, we ask that you somehow manage things so that Arjuna's vow is fulfilled. Help us to cross this ocean of grief and wrath. O Madhava, become a raft so that we do not sink in the vast Karu Sea. All glories to you, O Krishna, O Vishnu, O Hari, O John Ordana. You are the foremost of all men. Narada has pronounced you to be the best and most ancient of all beings. You always protect your surrendered servants, and we seek your protection today. Krishna appeared pleased as Yudhishthira stopped speaking. He replied in a sonorous voice, In all the worlds, including the heavens, there is no archer like Arjuna. That handsome hero will slay all your enemies. I will drive his chariot and will do everything in my power to assist him. Today you will see Jayadratha compelled to travel that road from which no traveler ever returns. Vultures, hawks and jackals will feast on his flesh tonight. O oh, Yudhishthira, even if Indra and the gods come to his aid, he will still be delivered to death's domain. Tonight, the victorious Arjuna will report to you that he has slain the Sinu monarch. Dismiss your grief and be attended with prosperity, O oh, king. As Krishna spoke, Arjuna entered the assembly. He came and bowed before Yudhishthira, who immediately stood to embrace him. Still holding his brother, Yudhishthira said, It is evident, O Dnaja, that you will have a great victory today. Your appearance at this moment portends it, as does Krishna's infallible blessing. Arjuna touched his brother's feet and went over to Krishna, bowing low with folded palms. He then took his seat and the Pandavas discussed the day's strategy. They had heard from their spies of Drona's plans to create a formation surrounding Jayadratha, protected at every point by the foremost warriors. Deciding upon a suitable counter-array, the Pandavas got up and went out for the battle. Krishna fetched Arjuna's chariot and equipped it with every kind of weapon. Dressed in effulgent gold armor, he drove the chariot to the royal tent. Arjuna came out and circumambulated the chariot with his Gandiva in hand. 
He then mounted the chariot like the sun rising over the eastern mountains saw Tyaki climbed aboard with him and the chariot moved off. Setting out to slay Jayadratha, Arjuna appeared like Indra accompanied by Varuna and Surya setting out to kill the Asuras. Countless musical instruments rang out, while bards and Brahmins sang Arjuna's glories and uttered benedictions. Hearing the chants and cheered by the other warriors as he went toward the battlefield, Arjuna felt confident and eager for the fight. From behind him a delightful breeze blew, bearing the fragrance of celestial blossoms Arjuna said to Satyaki, I think my victory today is assured. These signs all around us point to it and my mind feels infused. I will soon penetrate to the spot where Jayadratha stands, passing through all the heroes who desire to see my prowess and then go to Yamaraja's domain. O oh, mighty armed one, do not forget your prime duty to protect Yadhishthira. None can vanquish you in battle, and the king is as safe with you as he is with me. With you by his side, I will be able to attack Jayadratha with a peaceful mind, Satyaki said that he would not leave Yudhishthira as far as he was able. The two heroes continued to talk as Krishna drove the chariot toward the Kurukshetra plain, where millions of men had already assembled for the battle as sunrise approached, Drona issued orders for his great formation. Calling for Jayadratha he said, I will detail Karna to stand by your side. He will be supported by my own son, as well as Shalaya, Kripa and Brishasena. They will have with them a force of 100,000 horsemen, 60,000 chariots, 20,000 infantry, and 14,000 elephants. This detachment, with you in its midst, will form itself into an array shaped like a needle. The formation will be protected by a second, impenetrable array in the shape of a lotus. I will be at the head of that second formation. The king and his brothers, as well as numerous other powerful warriors, will stand in that array. At the front of these two formations I will create a semicircular array filled with warriors who will not retreat. At the foremost point before that will be an array resembling a cart, which will serve to draw in and capture any soldiers foolish enough to assail us from that direction. Indeed, I do not think that even Chaka, thunderbolt in hand, could reach you today, comforted, Jayadratha made his way to his position in the army. As he passed through the troops they shouted out their battle cries. Where is Arjuna they cried. Bring Bhima here, I am ready to do battle the warriors whirl their polished maces and brandish their swords. Maddened with pride, they roared tumultuously. They slapped their arms and blew their conches, proceeding swiftly and joyfully toward the battlefield. Gradually, carefully following Drona's detailed directions, the Kauravas formed themselves into the strategic array he had designed. It stretched for miles and appeared like a collection of clouds covering the earth. The wonderful configuration appeared so formidable that no one could imagine penetrating it. At its rear stood Jayadratha, heavily guarded on all sides drawn up, clad in a coat of white mail and a beautiful turban, moved about making the final arrangements. Seeing his shining chariot, with its crimson horses and its standard bearing the mark of a Brahmin's water pot in deer skin, the Kauravas were delighted. In the sky the Siddhas and Charyunas looked down with wonder at the Kauravas, spread out in their tremendous formation. Surely they will devour the whole earth with its mountains, oceans and forests, Doryodhan looks at his army with satisfaction. He still had many infantry, chariots, cavalry and elephants left. He gazed across at the advancing Pandava forces. How would Arjuna ever fulfill his vow? His promise had been rash. By sunset the war would be over. Taking up his ornate bow, Doryodhan ordered his charioteer to move off, eager for the battle to begin. As the Pandavas approached their enemies they saw Drona's formation with amazement. It seemed to have no end and it appeared like the ocean rolling across the battlefield toward them. Undaunted, Arjuna said, O oh Krishna, just see Drona's attempt to thwart my vow. The front lines are at least twenty miles across, and it must be twice that distance deep. But I will seek out its weak points and break it apart with fiery arrows. Before Drona's eyes I will cut down the sinful Jayadratha. As the two armies converged, one of Duryodhan's brothers, Dermershana, came to the front of the core of us. Roaring furiously he exclaimed, Watch as I check Arjuna, like the shore resisting the ocean. Let everyone see the irate and indomitable Dhananjaya collide with me, like one mass of rocks colliding with another. O oh, warriors, stay or turn back as you wish. I will fight with the Pandavas alone to enhance my glory and fame, 
Dermershana rushed across the field to begin the fight. He saw Arjuna's chariot at a distance, with Hanuman sitting on its towering standard. The roars of the celestial ape could be heard throughout the core of our forces. They mingled with the sounds of Arjuna's conch, which he blew repeatedly as he closed upon his foes. Both sounds filled the core of us hearts with anxiety as they again remembered how fiercely Arjuna fought when he was angry drone up had his musicians strike up cheering melodies, but a deafening clamor already filled the field Arjuna saw Dumarshana charging at him and he said, drive swiftly toward the core of a prince, O Madhava. I will meet his challenge and send him and all his followers reeling, Krishna drove the chariot straight into the mouth of the cart formation at the core of us head. As Arjuna faced Dumarshana he was immediately surrounded by thousands of chariot fighters. Thinking of his son he began to slay them mercilessly. Worked up to the highest pitch of fury, he scattered his shafts in all directions. The opposing warriors' heads fell like lotuses torn from their stems. Gold armor spattered with blood lay gleaming on the ground. Chariots were smashed, elephants slain, and horses deprived of their riders. Headless infantrymen ran about wildly, still clutching their swords, before falling lifeless to the earth. After a brief fight, Dermershano was routed and put to flight. Wounded all over his body, his armor shattered and standard broken, he raced away from his enemy Arjuna spared his life only to honor Bhimas now. In a short time Arjuna had slain several thousand of his foes. His chariot hurtled about with such speed that the core of our troops felt there were hundreds of Arjunas. In their fear and confusion, they struck and killed each other. Crying in agony and steeped in blood, many heroes lay dying on the field. Whoever came toward Arjuna soon found himself pierced by a fatal shaft. No one could detect any weakness in him as he danced on the terrace of his chariot, his bow always drawn to a circle Krishna's driving was unrivaled and he constantly thwarted the Korova's attacks Drona and the other Korova chiefs were astonished to see Arjuna annihilating their troops, even as the sun destroys darkness. The killing of Abhimanyu had clearly turned him into a different person. He had been formidable before, but now he was fighting with a frenzied passion, showing no quarter. The warriors surrounding him broke and ran. Seeing Arjuna pressing steadily through the core of our ranks, Dashashana came forward on his chariot and challenged him. He was supported by a mighty division of elephants that quickly surrounded Arjuna. The Tuskers had large bells around their necks which clanged as they raced about the field. Arjuna sent up a fierce war cry and began to kill the elephants with winged arrows that pierced their tough hides. Like a killer whale plunging through the ocean, he penetrated the elephant division and brought them down one after another. He struck each elephant with a hundred shafts and they fell like cliffs broken by thunderbolts. Gushing streams of blood, they dropped, screaming, to the ground. The warriors fighting on their backs were swept off by Arjuna's shafts, which penetrated two or three of them at once. Seeing the elephant force in disarray, Dashashana fled. It was impossible to face Arjuna in his present mood. The core of Ara stepped to Drona and sought his protection. Drona licked his lips and moved through his forces toward Arjuna. Seeing his preceptor advancing upon him with upraised weapons, Arjuna folded his palms and bowed his head. He called out, O Brahman, wish me well and bless me. I desire to pass through this impenetrable array. You are the same to me as my own father, or as Yudhishthira or Krishna. Thus even as Ashvathama deserves your protection, so do I let me pass. I wish to slay the Sinahu ruler. O Lord, O best of men, see to it that my vow is fulfilled, O Bibatsu, you will not be able to conquer Jayadratha without first defeating me, Drona then shot a hundred arrows at Arjuna in swift succession. The Pandava skillfully countered them and replied with a hundred of his own Drona warded off Arjuna's attack with these and at once pierced both him and Krishna with shafts resembling blazing tongues of fire. He cut Arjuna's bowstring and covered his chariot with arrows. Arjuna attacked him back with six hundred arrows fired with such speed that it appeared as if he had shot only one shaft. He followed that with another seven hundred, then a thousand, then ten thousand, training them on the warriors who supported Drona. Seeing him again slaying large numbers of the core of our troops, Drona pierced Arjuna's chest with a powerful barbed arrow. Hit hard by that shaft, Arjuna trembled like a mountain during an earthquake. Quickly regaining his composure, he broke off the arrow which was embedded in his armor. He focused his attention on Drona and sent showers of arrows at him. Drona replied by covering Arjuna with shafts. 
neither Arjuna nor Krishna nor their chariot was visible as Drona assailed them with countless arrows, which fell in unbroken lines. Working hard, Krishna drove the chariot away from Drona's arrows. As the chariot came clear of the attack he said, O Portha, there is no time to waste Jayadratha still stands a great distance from here. This battle with Drona could go on all day. Leave him aside and proceed ahead with all speed, Arjuna realized that Krishna was right. There was little chance of defeating Drona, nor did he relish fighting with him. Once again folding his palms, Arjuna called out, O oh my lord, I will now take my leave. You are my preceptor and I do not wish to fight with you further. There exists no man in all the worlds who can vanquish you in battle. Please bless me. I am going on. Krishna urged on Arjuna's horses and the chariot raced away, leaving Drona to the right. As they passed him he shouted, Where are you going, Dhananjaya? Have you become afraid Drona again released volleys of arrows at Arjuna, but Krishna drove the chariot so fast that all of his shafts fell short. With Drona still calling, Arjuna sped away, leaving him far behind. He was joined by Yadamanayu and Udamarajas, two powerful Panchalas who had fought their way through to him. They protected him on either side of his chariot as he rushed forward into the hostile array. As Drona turned to chase Arjuna, the Pandava commander, Drastaki too, challenged him with a roar Drona turned to face him and was immediately struck by a volley of shafts Drona's horses, chariot, and charioteer were all covered by Drastaki too's arrows Drona blazed up like an infuriated mountain lion suddenly roused from slumber. He released a razor-faced arrow that cut apart his opponent's bow. Drastaki to then took up another bow and in an instant fired a hundred more arrows. Not minding the attack, Drona shot four crescent-headed shafts that slew his enemy's horses and cut down his charioteer. Drastaki to leapt from his stationary chariot, mace in hand, and charged Drona. Whirling about as he ran, he hurled the mace with all his power and it flew at Drona spitting fire. Drona at once shot dozens of hammer-headed shafts that smashed the mace to pieces. Drastaki to then picked up a long lance from the earth and threw it violently, but again the Karu Perceptor cut it down in mid-flight Drona then set a long, Anjalika shaft on his bow. Empowering it with mantras, he fired it from his fully drawn bow and it struck Drastaki to on the chest. The shaft pierced right through the Chidi King and entered the earth behind him. Seeing his foe falling to the ground, Drona looked around for Arjuna. The Pandava had disappeared into the throng Drona decided to make his way swiftly toward Jayadratha. No doubt he would get his chance to meet Arjuna there before too long. After leaving Drona, Arjuna plunged into the core of us. Like maladies afflicting the body, he afflicted his enemies with fiery shafts. Roaring and blowing his conch, he attacked the core of us as if demented. He launched blazing arrows from the Gandiva end to end. They fell unfailingly upon men horses and elephants, leaving them floundering Kritavarma challenged Arjuna, setting it not their long-standing friendship. The Pandava and the Vrishni fought. No difference could be detected between the two as they matched weapon for weapon. It appeared as if Yamaraja were contending with death personified. Arrows charged with mantras collided in midair with mighty explosions. Both men circled each other and released a continuous stream of shafts. Both were pierced in all parts of their bodies as they sought for weak spots in their foe Krishna again said to Arjuna, Do not spare him. You are losing too much time. Forgetting your relationship with him, crush him at once, charged with Krishna's admonition, Arjuna shot a cluster of shafts at Kritavarma that broke his bow and sent him reeling. Taking his opportunity, Arjuna rushed past him and pressed on into the core of our ranks. As Kritavarma came back to his senses, he was assailed by Arjuna's two protectors, who kept him at bay as Arjuna pushed forward. Then the Kalinga king, Srutayash, charged Arjuna. Whirling a huge mace, he closed rapidly on the pond of Arjuna sped three dozen shafts at him and the king took up his own bow, sending fifty arrows back. After an exchange of shafts, Srutayash leapt down from his chariot and ran at Arjuna with his mace held aloft. Srutayash, the son of the river Parnasa, had received a boon from Varuna that his mace would prove irresistible to all. However, the god had warned him, do not attack anyone who is not fighting or this weapon will kill you. In the heat of the battle, Srutayash forgot Varuna's warning. 
As he reached Arjuna's chariot he swung his mace at Krishna and dealt him a great blow. Krishna received the blow on his broad shoulders without shaking, even as a mountain is unshaken by a tempest. In accord with Varuna's words, however, Srutayash's mace turned as he lifted it to again strike Krishna. It smashed into his own head and killed him. The Kauravas wailed on seeing the hero killed by his own weapon. His army fled, crying out in fear Sudakshina, a Kambhaja prince, challenged Arjuna and fired hundreds of arrows at him. Arjuna warded off the shafts and Sudakshina hurled a dreadful iron lance, furnished with bells and a long, spike point. It blazed brilliantly and emitted sparks as it flew. Hit by the lance, Arjuna fell to his knees in a swoon. Krishna swiftly circled the chariot around as Arjuna recovered his senses. Getting to his feet, Arjuna licked the corners of his mouth and glared at Sudakshina. He drew the Gandiva back to his ear and shot a volley of shafts that smashed the prince's chariot. Arjuna then struck him on the chest with an arrow charged with the force of a thunderbolt. With his chariot falling apart all around him, the prince dropped headlong to the earth like a tree cut at its root. After killing the prince Arjuna encountered the armies of the Surasinus, Abhisahus, Sinus and Vasidus. Driving into their midst, he dispersed them with his weapons. Oblivious to the immense volumes of arrows which fell upon him, which were either struck down by Arjuna's own shafts or deflected from his impenetrable armor, he annihilated the warriors as if appointed by Yamaraja to bring on the end of the Yuga. Continuously pressing forward toward Jayadratha, he left a trail of devastation. Sixty thousand of his antagonists were slain in less than an hour. The survivors turned and fled, crying out to Duryodhana and Drona for protection. Three of Srutayash's sons then attacked Arjuna, hoping to avenge their father. They were powerful fighters. For some time, Arjuna's chariot was hardly visible beneath the shower of weapons they launched at him. Arrows, darts and lances rained down on both Arjuna and Krishna. They appeared like the twin peaks of the great mountain lashed by a violent storm. Gradually, however, Arjuna checked his opponent's missiles and his chariot again appeared on the battlefield. Placing a long golden arrow onto the Gandiva, he invoked the Shakra weapon, presided over by the king of the gods. Thousands of shafts went toward the princes like streaks of lightning, cutting down all their arrows and other missiles. Those deadly shafts struck the princes with terrible force, severing their arms, legs and heads from their trunks. Many thousands of Korovan warriors supporting the princes were also annihilated. Having swept away the three Kalinga princes, Arjuna sent up a triumphant cry and charged into the thick array of Korovas between himself and Jayadratha. While the other Pandavas and their forces engaged with the principal Korovan warriors, Arjuna plowed through their army like a raging fire. All the other Pandava fighters were left far behind as he battled his way through the enemy. Hearing that Arjuna was steadily approaching the Sinahu ruler, Doryodhan spoke with Drona, who had resumed his position near the core of a prince. Drona had thought it best to stay near Jayadratha, supporting his generals. He would stand a better chance of checking Arjuna when flanked by Kripla, Karna and Ashvathanwa. The Pandava would be hard-pressed to get past him again. Doryodhan looked apprehensively at his commander, O Preceptor, Arjuna is crushing our forces. Like a fire among dry weeds, the Dhananjaya fire, strengthened by the wind of his anger, is swallowing up my forces. The warriors protecting Jayadratha are trembling with fear. You are our only shelter. Everyone came to the fight today believing that Arjuna would not escape with his life when you faced him. O oh, illustrious one, it seems you are attached to the Pandavas and therefore I have become confused, not knowing what to do next, Doryodhan's tone was imploring. He looked anxiously about the field Karna stood at a distance with his weapons at the ready, but even he would find it hard to check Arjuna in his present mood. Only Drona could stop him, if he so desired. There was not a warrior in all the worlds who could overpower Drona in battle. As Arjuna's instructor, he knew everything about his mode of fighting and any possible weakness. There could only be one reason why he had not already slain Arjuna or Yodun frowned. To the best of my ability I have always tried to please you, great Brahmin, but it seems you do not value my service. O oh man of infinite prowess, although we are devoted to you, it appears you do not wish us well. Although you live on our bread, still you injure us. I now see that you are like a razor soaked in honey. If you had not assured me, I would not have prevented Jayadratha from returning to his kingdom. Fool that I am, I believed you, 
and as a result I have virtually offered him as a victim to death. Indeed, a man might escape even when he enters death's jaws, but there is no chance that Jayadratha will escape when he faces the infuriated Arjuna in battle. Doryodhan wept tears of frustration, trying by any means to incite Drona to attack Arjuna. Afraid that he may have had the opposite effect, he spoke more gently. O oh hero, forgive my ravings for I am afflicted by a grief. I fall at your feet. Please save Jayadratha, and indeed our army, from the enraged and invincible Arjuna. Drona looked wearied. How many times did Doryodhan have to be told? I am not offended by your words, O oh ruler of men. You are the same to me as my own son. Thus I have tried in every way to assist you. I have tendered you wholesome advice, but you have not listened. I have made vows for your benefit, fully intent on keeping them. Before all men I promised to capture Yadhishthira, but it was to no avail. Again, I vowed to protect Jayadratha, but how is it possible when we face Arjuna and Krishna together on one chariot? I can only endeavor to my full extent, I cannot control the results. Destiny is the ultimate controller, despite man's exertion, and the lord of destiny sits by Arjuna's side, Drona shook his head and looked around at the thick ranks of warriors protecting Jayadratha. Doubtlessly they would all soon lie dead Arjuna would spare none in his efforts to slay the Sinu king, and Krishna would do anything to protect his friend's promise. He had already shown that enough times Doryodhan, however, was faithless and could not understand this simple truth. With the sweep of his hand Drona indicated the forces surrounding him. These troops are the last line of defense for Jayadratha. I will not personally confront Arjuna again, as I am needed here. Nor will he fight with me at present. When I tried engaging with him, he simply left me standing. Drona could understand that the situation was desperate. The Pandavas had thought out their strategy well. Their forces had pressed ahead behind Arjuna, taking advantage of the chaos he was causing. All the chief Korovan warriors were engaged in different parts of the field, either fighting or remaining in critical positions for Jayadratha's protection. Someone had to check Arjuna, but Doryodhan was the only one available. Drona continued, O oh great hero, you are a mighty Maharatha, possessed of fame and skilled at defeating your enemies. Go to where Arjuna stands. Challenge him yourself and arrest his progress, Doryodhan looked up in astonishment. O preceptor, how do you honestly expect me to stop Arjuna? I may be able to conquer Indra, armed with his thunderbolt and heading the host of gods, but it will not be possible to conquer Arjuna. He has already overcome you and Kritavarma, as well as slaying all of the Kalinga rulers. He has also slaughtered myriads of fierce barbarian fighters. How will I face him? O oh, great one, I am dependent on you. Please save my honor, what you say is true, O oh king. No one can defeat Arjuna. Under normal circumstances I would not risk you against him, but we face a dire calamity. Still, you need not fear. I will make you invincible even to Arjuna. I will tie on your armor in such a way that will make it impenetrable to both human and celestial weapons. Even if the creatures of the three worlds come together against you, still you need not fear Arjuna knows how to do this, but no one else on this battlefield. Take off your armor, O king, and I will tie it on again while reciting the ancient mantras uttered by Brahma himself. You may then proceed fearlessly against the mighty Pandava. Doryodhan quickly removed his golden armor. After Drona had touched water for purification and rinsed his mouth, he replaced it while intoning mantras. When he had finished he said, you will now be able to face any foe with impunity. This celestial armor, invoked by my prayers, was originally given by Brahma to Indra. Clad in this armor, Indra fought and defeated Vritrasura, who had overpowered all the other celestials. O king, go forward and face Arjuna. There is no time to lose. As the sun reached the meridian on the thirteenth day, many terrific battles were being fought between the respected heroes on both sides. Drishtadyana was steadily pressing forward, hoping to meet Rona in single combat. Bhima constantly sought out Dhritarashtra's sons. While Yudhishthira engaged with Shalaya and his division of warriors saw Tyaki encountered Balika, Sahadev fought with Shakuni, Gatotkacha and his Rakshasa hordes with Alambasha and his supporters, and the other chief fighters among the Pandavas fought opponents of equal might. Fighting with human and celestial weapons, 
The great warriors created a beautiful sight on the battlefield as they attacked and counterattacked each other, displaying all their skills. Meanwhile, Arjuna continued to plow through the tightly packed core of our troops. Hearing news of his progress, Jayadratha shook with fear Karna and Ashvathama stood by his sides, grim-faced. Still some twenty miles from Jayadratha, Arjuna fought on remorselessly. With his fiery shafts he created breaches in the enemy defenses, and Krishna would then quickly drive the chariot through. Wherever the chariot went, the Kauravas were driven back like darkness at sunrise Arjuna's arrows slew men standing a full two miles away. His well-tempered and polished steel shafts dropped from the sky like showers of meteors. As Arjuna annihilated the troops who opposed him, Krishna baffled their attacks by his skillful driving, exhibiting various expert maneuvers as the chariot moved with circular, backwards, and sideways motions. Sometimes Arjuna's progress was swift and at other times slow, but no one saw him cease fighting for a moment. His bow was constantly drawn and arrows flew out in endless streams. It took great courage to even look at him. Thousands of warriors, careless of their lives, rushed against him and perished like insects falling into a fire. As the sun began its downward course, Arjuna was attacked by Vinda and Yunvindra, the two princes of Yuvanti. Both were Maharathas and they came at Arjuna from both sides at once. Roaring in delight, the fearless warriors charged at Arjuna, releasing their long-shafted arrows by the hundreds. Surprised by their sudden appearance, Arjuna was hit hard by more than sixty arrows. Krishna was pierced with the same number and the horses were all caught with twenty arrows each. Blazing in anger, Arjuna shook off their shafts and aimed his own arrows at his antagonists, looking for their vulnerable points. He struck both of them and stopped their forward charge. The two princes screamed out their battle cries and covered Arjuna with a downpour of arrows. Ignoring the attack, Arjuna carefully aimed a couple of bronze-headed shafts and cut apart both their bows. With two more arrows he cut off their standards, and with another dozen he slew their charioteers and horses. All this happened in a matter of moments. Before the princes could do anything Arjuna shot a crescent-headed shaft with full force that severed Vinda's head. Seeing his brother slain, Yunvinda leapt from his chariot bellowing with rage. Clutching his mace he raced toward Arjuna. Yunvinda swerved from side to side as he ran, determined to avenge Vinda's death. Reaching Arjuna's chariot, he brought the mace down with all his power onto Krishna's foreign. Krishna remained firm. Utterly enraged to see Yunvinda strike Krishna, Arjuna shot five short shafts that cut off his arms, legs and head. The prince fell down like fragments of rocks shattered by an explosion. Seeing both their leaders killed, the Yuvanti army rushed in a body at Arjuna. The Pandavas slew them with arrows shot from the Gandiva which appeared like showers of sparks flying up from a great fire. Whirling about in his chariot, he consumed the army like a fire consuming a forest at the end of the summer. Thousands of other troops then came at Arjuna. His chariot was completely lost in the enemy ranks. Krishna found it impossible to move in any direction. As the battle raged on, he said, O oh poor thought, such is the intensity of this fight that even our celestial horses are becoming weary. We are still far from Jayadratha and they need rest, fighting continuously, Arjuna replied, O oh Madhava, I will create a path through these foes. You may then take the chariot through, unyoke the horses, and let them rest. Draw out the arrows from their bodies while I keep these warriors in check, Arjuna directed a great stream of arrows at his enemies and forced them back. He then leapt down from the chariot, still releasing countless shafts, and Krishna drove away from him. The Kauravas, seeing Arjuna standing on the ground, felt that their opportunity for victory had arrived. Roaring even louder, they ignored Krishna and the chariot and trained all their weapons on Arjuna. Arjuna fought on foot against them. He spun around and shot searing arrows in all directions. The amazed Kauravas could not find any gap in his defenses. To approach him was to rush into a solid wall of arrows. The meeting of Arjuna's shafts with those of his adversaries created a sheet of fire in the sky. Scorched, the Kauravas fell back. Arjuna ran over to where Krishna had released the horses. Krishna told him that they needed water and Arjuna replied, It shall be done, drawing back his bow with a golden arrow fixed to it. Arjuna uttered incantations to invoke the Varunastra. He shot the arrow at the earth and at once a large lake appeared, with swans, ducks, and other aquatic birds swimming amid lotuses and lilies. 
The clear pond had been transported from the heavenly regions and was cool and pleasing. A gentle breeze blew over it and celestial sages were seated on its banks. Invoking another mystical weapon, Arjuna constructed a shelter on the lakeside made entirely of arrows. Krishna laughed and applauded him. He led the horses into the shelter where, after drinking their fill, they lay on the grassy ground. Krishna then removed their arrows and gently massaged their bodies. The Kauravas had rallied and again surrounded Arjuna, who continued to fight on foot. Showers of arrows, darts and lances fell upon him, but he stood as firm as Mount Meru. He received the massive downpour of weapons like a mountain receiving rain. Even as the single fault of covetousness destroys all a man's good qualities, he single-handedly destroyed his enemies. Contending alone against countless warriors seated on chariots, horses and elephants, Arjuna appeared wonderful. Celestials praised him and the Kauravas themselves applauded his prowess. They marveled at the sight of the lake and the shelter he had created. Despite strenuous exertions, they could not overcome him even though he was disadvantaged by the loss of his chariot. His speed, lightness of hand and agility were too great. As he held off the Kaurava forces, Krishna harnessed the horses and drove up to Arjuna's side. As he did so, the mystical lake, with its birds, aquatics and rishis, vanished. Mounted again on his chariot, Arjuna sounded his Kong Krishna urged on the horses, and the chariot rushed into the thick of the Kauravas, with Arjuna spraying deadly shafts on all sides. Like a storm agitating the ocean, he created havoc among the enemy ranks. The Kauravas were beaten back and unable to check his progress. Some of them called out, Fie upon Doryodhan. It is his fault that the earth now faces such a calamity. These two heroes will spare no one, other Kauravas said, Dhritarashtra should begin the preparations for Jayadratha's last rites. The Sindhu ruler will be killed today, Arjuna pressed forward relentlessly. Only four hours remained until sunset and he still had ten miles of troops to cross. The bravest of the Kauravas rushed against him, but like rivers entering the sea they did not return. Other cowardly warriors, like atheists turning away from scripture, turned back from the fight, thus incurring condemnation and sin. The fire-colored chariot Krishna drove appeared like Surya's chariot driven by Aruna. It tore through the core of our ranks. Rested and refreshed, the horses raced ahead, seeming to rise up into the sky at every moment Arjuna and Krishna appeared like two fiery suns risen together at the end of the age. Anyone coming near them was burnt by the fire of Arjuna's weapons and fell lifeless to the earth. The Kauravas facing Arjuna became dispirited and hopeless. They struggled vainly to check him from reaching Jayadratha, but in less than an hour Arjuna could see in the distance Drona's tall standard. With a triumphant shout he said, See there the preceptor's banner, O Madhava. I think we are drawing close to the Sinu king. He cannot be more than a few miles away. Krishna again advised Arjuna to circumvent Drona so as not to lose time, but Drona had already seen him and was shooting arrows that flew more than two miles and pierced both him and Krishna. Bleeding from their wounds, they appeared like two flowering Karnikara trees. Krishna drove the chariot away from Drona's attack, placing a body of Kaurava troops between them. He then moved in a great circle around Drona's division. Arjuna continuously launched his blazing shafts and unending lines that struck down men, horses and elephants alike. As Arjuna came within a few miles of Jayadratha, he was suddenly met by Doryodhan. With his impenetrable armor shining brilliantly, the Kaurava prince sent up a mighty roar and charged. Drawing up his chariot at a short distance from his enemy, he shouted out a challenge. Krishna stopped the chariot and said, Behold Ritarashtra's powerful son standing fearlessly before you. He has constantly hated the Pandavas and is an accomplished warrior, capable of contending with innumerable warriors at once. I think, O oh sinless one, that the time has come when you should fight with him. Upon him rests victory or defeat. Vomit upon him the venom of your wrath, O oh Portha. It is your good fortune that has brought him before you alone. Why has he risked his life in this way? Surely he will soon regret his folly. Strike down this evil-hearted one and the war will be over. O oh, Arjuna, kill him and cut the root of the wicked Kauravas. Arjuna stared angrily at the bellowing door Yodun. Let it be so. Go closer to this wretch so that I may punish him with sharpened shafts. I will now avenge the wrongs he committed against Draupadi. Krishna drove the chariot toward Duryodhan. 
Seeing the core of a chief exhibiting no fear, even though there was sufficient cause, many warriors looked on and applauded. Others cried out in sorrow, considering Doryo done to be like a libation of ghee poured into a sacrificial fire. The king is slain. The king is slain, they cried in terror. Hearing their cries, Doryo done laughed. Dispel your fears. I will soon send these two to death's abode, Doryo done taunted Arjuna. Oh poor thought, let me see your prowess. Release all the weapons you have learned from Drona and received from the Celestials. Watch as I repulse your attack. Then I will sever your head along with Krishna's. Doryodhan immediately pierced Arjuna with three arrows that flew invisibly toward him. With four more he pierced each of his horses, and with another ten he struck Krishna. With another well-aimed arrow he cut the whip in Krishna's hand, which fell to the ground in two pieces. Arjuna drew the Gandiva back to his ear and fired four steel-headed shafts that screamed through the air. Hitting Doryodhan's armor they fell harmlessly to the earth. Arjuna released another sixteen arrows which were again deflected from his armor. He shot twenty more shafts with even more power, but these were also ineffective against Doryodhan's armor. Seeing this, Krishna said with surprise, I have not seen this before. Your arrows, capable of penetrating the earth, are falling uselessly from Doryodhan's armor. Is everything well with you, O Portha? Is the Gandiva losing its power? Why are you unable to pierce your enemy? This is not the time to fail. What is the cause Arjuna understood? Looking at the laughing Doryodhan, he replied, I think Drona has tied on Doryodhan's armor today. It contains the might of the three worlds. Only Drona knows its secret and he has taught it to me. No weapons can pierce this armor. Surely you know this, O oh Krishna, because you know everything. Yet see how this fool stands before me. He is like a woman clad in armor and does not know how to take advantage of his position. Even though he is protected by an impenetrable coat of mail, I will still defeat him. Watch as I send him reeling from my attack, Doryodhan stood fearlessly in his chariot and called to Arjuna derisively, Try again, O oh poor thought. I think you are losing your touch. He fired a thick volley of shafts that covered both Arjuna and Krishna. The Kauravas watching the fight were delighted to see Doryodhan impervious to Arjuna's attack. They roared and beat their drums. Fending off Doryodhan's arrows, Arjuna became incensed. With a taut smile he slew Doryodhan's four horses. He then broke apart his chariot with a hundred hammer-headed shafts. Taking another four arrows with extended points, he empowered them with mantras and aimed them carefully at the core of Ut. The arrows struck Doryodhan on the tips of his fingers, the only exposed part of his body, as he was releasing his own shafts. He screamed in pain as they went under his nails. Dropping his bow he jumped about on the terrace of his chariot, shaking his hand in agony. Seeing their leader distressed, other Korovan warriors rushed to his rescue. They surrounded Arjuna with chariots, elephants and horses Kripa, who had come to Doryodhan's assistance, took him on his chariot, bearing the emblem of a bull, and carried him to safety Arjuna again set to slaying the Korova troops. He soon managed to break free from his assailants. As his chariot emerged from the enemy array, both he and Krishna blew their conchels with full power. That sound filled the battlefield and terrified the Korovas. Jayadratha also heard it in the distance and froze in his chariot, looking fearfully in the direction of the sound. Elsewhere on the field the other Pandavas had been fighting and destroying thousands of foes. The losses on both sides were great. The earth again assumed a terrible aspect, with the bodies of slain men and beasts lying about amid the wreckage of chariots, armor and weapons.